Good evening, everyone. My name is Daphna Rubinovich, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to the Giller Book Club, the 10th in a series of 14. Please check our website for more information. There's only four more to go. Please make sure to have your Zoom on a side-by-side -side view for the best possible experience. Tonight, it is my profound pleasure to introduce you to our interviewer, Ian Williams. Born in Brampton, Ian won the Scotiabank Giller Prize in 2019 for his brilliant novel, Reproduction. His latest book is entitled World Problems and is a poetry collection that considers the ethical and political issues of our time as math and grammar problems. He is the author of Personals, which was shortlisted for the Griffin Poetry Prize and the Robert Proch Poetry Book Award. The book, Not Anyone's Anything, which won the Danuta Gleed Literary Award for the best first collection of short fiction in Canada. And You Know Who You Are, a finalist for the Relit Prize for Poetry. He was named as one of 10 Canadian writers to watch by CBC. Williams completed his PhD in English at the University of Toronto, mentored by George Eliot Clark, and after a stint as assistant professor of poetry in the creative writing program at the University of British Columbia, Columbia, excuse me, he has returned to Ontario to work at the University of Toronto. Tonight, Ian will be interviewing Lynn Cody, author of Watching You Without Me, long listed for the 2020 Scotiabank Giller Prize. There will be lots of fascinating questions and a reading. And if you'd like to join the quick the conversation, please feel free to submit a question using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you submit a question, your name will be entered into a draw to win two free audible titles of your own choosing. So please join the conversation. I don't want to waste any more of your time. So without further ado, please welcome Ian and Lynn. Hi, good evening, everyone. Really happy to be here in this book club format uh, with you, speaking with Lynn Cody as well. Hi, Lynn. Hi. So it's really neat that we get to speak in this this kind of format. You know, usually in events, we kind of have to, uh, you know, hide and not spoil the ending and stuff like that. But we can speak pretty openly and honestly about the book. Let me introduce you first, Lynn, and then we will get started. Uh, as Daphna said, uh, please post your questions in the Q&A uh, function there. We'll compile them all and uh, ask them towards the end. So just load up your questions there. Lynn Cody is the author of six books, including Hell Going, which uh, won the Scotiabank Giller Prize in 2013. It was a finalist for the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize and was the best book selection of Amazon and the Globe and Mail. She's the author of The Antagonist, winner of the George uh, Bunet Award for Fiction and a finalist for the Scotiabank Giller Prize. She has also been, long, uh, also been a finalist for the Governor General's Prize and uh, published throughout the world, including France, Germany, the UK, the US, and the Netherlands. Lynn, you're a much beloved author here in Canada. As I'm reading your bio here, I'm thinking like, I would love to hear you in conversation with Miriam Taves. I feel like that would be fantastic, right? I'm There's something- in conversation with Miriam Taves, she's great. Right? You remind me of each other in a way, in terms of how you approach both uh, like the tragic and the horrific and also the, the humorous, uh, some, some real overlap there. Do you, do you see it as well or? I, I just like hugely complimented right now. So <laughs> don't know what to say <laughs> because yeah like I Miriam is, is the master of those two things and and counterbalance so sort of mm -hmm. and um I don't think anybody does it as well as her but like I'm I'm thrilled to be compared well speaking of balance here there's Kelly and Karen at the heart of this novel two sisters mm -hmm. and um uh through these two sisters we get to see caregiving from two sides right we get to see the responsibility uh, of caring for someone, um, uh, the pressures and the burdens and the difficulty of it. And then we get to see in Kelly, the vulnerability of being cared for. And if you're left alone, the risks uh, that, that you run. And so we see these two things in balance. Was this one of your, um, one of your aims or one of your goals to kind of hold uh, the two sides of caregiving in balance? Or did you set off wanting to talk about what it was like to be a caregiver? I don't know. 
know. I don't know what my aim was necessarily, but I, I know I did want to talk about caregiving um, mm. as, a, as an idea and as, as a concept and as, you know, a vocation in some ways. Um, but the idea of, you know, there's the, there's the actual, you know, busy work of it, but there's also the actual consequence of it, which is if it's not done and if it's not done right, right. Um, the people are, are vulnerable. People could, could get into trouble. Is like, is sort of something Karen is grappling with because, you know, caregiving is something she's just sort of always repudiated in, in a really knee jerk kind of way because her mother was such a paragon of it and, mm. and just seemed to kind of cling to it as her personality and you know it, it instantly sort of made her mother moral and righteous and and like Karen just associated it with kind of self-righteousness and right. and a way of you know not a way of sort of turning your back on your own life so you just pour everything into this one person and so Karen always thought of it as if that's what I end up doing, that's what I'm going to have to do. I'm going to have to just destroy who I am, my personality, my life in that really traditional way that, you know, women have always been sort of expected to do as caregivers. This is what Karen thinks is waiting for her. Um, so that's sort of her preoccupation when she arrives to look after Kelly. She knows she doesn't really want to do that. But once she gets there and starts looking after Kelly, you know, it's not just that she becomes aware of Kelly's vulnerability, but she sort of becomes aware that her mother wasn't kidding. Like there really is a joyful side to caregiving. And it just, it has to do with that bond with the other person. And like something, just something as simple as, you know, rediscovering your relationship with your sister and what you liked about her and what your rapport is and like all that stuff sort of comes back into play. And Karen finds that, you know, having someone to look after is onerous, yes, and isn't necessarily what she, you know, wanted to sign up for as an adult, but is something that also has um, its gratification. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't see a lot of characters in, in Canadian literature that have disabilities, uh, and particularly like intellectual dif uh, disabilities. Um, and if we do see them, we don't see them as adults, right? There's this kind of mindset that disabilities are identified in children. You get IEPs and you get special programs. And then what happens though, beyond the school years, as in life, they seem to kind of like vanish from uh, yeah. like the public life. Yeah. But no, Kelly's what, pushing 50 or she's she's mm -hmm. up there. Yeah, she's about right? 50. Right, and you keep her present throughout the entire novel. I got the sense that you really respected her. <laughs> right, to keep her present there and to have us work with and around her presence in the novel. Um, yeah, why these choices? Like you didn't age her. This could have been, you know, that moment when they were in their 20s and mm -hmm. she had the choice to make. You could have written the novel, a really compelling novel at that point. Mm -hmm. why, why at this point, after a divorce? And with um, I mean, there, there's, gosh, <laughs> there's mm -hmm. something about, like what you're saying about how we, we don't really see adults and we don't see older adults mm -hmm. with these kind of disabilities depicted very often. And I think there is an element of, you know, we can imagine ourselves caring for younger people to an extent mm -hmm. and we can feel that sympathy and, um, you know, but when it's like, like Karen at, at a certain point describes Kelly as she's like 200 pounds and she's got a skin condition and she gets ear infections. Like, like imagine a 200 pound infant. <laughs> All of a sudden they're not so cute anymore. And like Kelly is very lovable and, but like very superficially walking through the door and meeting someone like Kelly, it's like you have to kind of grapple with her and, and what she requires of you. Um, and I feel like, you know, I, I just grew up with with a grown up like Kelly in my life. Um, and he was, he was a huge part of my life. Like he, my uncle lived with us. And um, it, it was, my experience of him is very much the way Kelly is in the novel, which is you're, you're dealing with him every day and his idiosyncrasy, idiosyncrasies and his you know, personality quirks and his, his demands and his, his issues. And it's just like, 
in the same way you're dealing with your mother and your brother and your father, you also have your uncle and he's his own thing. Um, and I guess part of what I wanted to get across is the sort of everydayness of, of that, of, of Kelly being her own thing. And for the reader at first, it's like, oh, this is, this is novel, this is interesting. But, but I really wanted the reader to experience, it. no, eventually it's not gonna be novel anymore. It's just gonna be Kelly. And then right. you'll, you'll know Kelly as a, as a human being. Right, right. Someone has to clean Kelly, right? And like, it's not <laughs> just all Kelly making cute repetitions and stuff, but at some point, the real work. And I, I feel like the life of the novel wants to exist and to continue. And it, um, it's not constrained by Kelly, but Kelly's a real consideration in terms of what can happen. Uh, if Karen wants to leave and go out, we have mm -hmm. to think about who's going to take care of Kelly in, in the mm -hmm. novel. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, as a reader, this kind of develops, uh, it's both affection and like responsibility, Lynn, right? Like it's, yes. we talk about like reading, developing empathy a lot, right? But mm -hmm. how about reading, developing responsibility that we kind of think, okay, as I'm reading this plot here, what about Kelly, right? She's always <laughs> in the back of our minds, right? As we're reading this book, it was really fascinating yeah. um, to see that happen. Yeah. Right. Um, I wonder if you could read for us. Uh, oh. I know you've selected a passage that involves Kelly, so I'm looking forward to that. Sure. Yeah, this is, I mean, I, I, I find myself, or I have found myself reading this particular passage a lot um, when I was touring back in the days when we left our houses and went places to read from our books. <laughs> Um, and it just sort of brought home to me how much this story is about um, Karen and her mother and kind of the, the philosophical argument they've had with one another throughout their, their time together and how it all kind of revolves around Kelly and, and what it means to sort of um, center her in your life. So this, this sort of, this is a sort of typical kind of memory that, that Karen has of growing up with her mother and Kelly. It was always interesting to me how children responded to my sister. They saw immediately that something was different with her, but they were usually more fascinated than scared. When I was 11, my mother's substitute taught my Wednesday morning religion class for a few weeks. All my classmates had adored her, of course, and complained when depressive and shiny faced sister Claire returned after her hysterectomy. But my mother had been a volunteer who knew nothing about teaching, and so she usually just spent the hour presiding over vague theological discussions on issues like what it meant to be a good Samaritan or why Jesus was mean to his mother and told her to go away that time. One day at loose ends for a lesson plan, and because the babysitter got hung up, my mother decided she would bring Kelly to class. It would be a class about Kelly. I begged her not to, but she insisted that this was a great idea. It would teach my classmates about unusual people. So the kids all pulled up their chairs around my sister like she was the winning display at a science fair and Kelly sat rocking and sneaking shy, smiling glances at everyone from beneath her bangs. Even as a child herself, she always loved children. When you all came into the classroom today and saw Kelly for the first time, said my mother after everyone had settled and gaped, what was your first impression of her? There's something different about her, one tactful girl responded. The children had already been infected by my mother's air of benevolence. They knew not to come out with an indiscreet word like wrong. She's special, said a triumphant boy. He knew this word because there was a group of students known as the special class in our school. More functional than Kelly, able to learn a few academic basics. We only saw them coming and going in the hallways though. They weren't permitted to linger in the playground at recess with the rest of us. I knew from watching kids following them in the hallways, limping and slobbering in comic exaggeration, they would have been mocked to death if they were. She is special, said my mother. We're all special because God made every one of us. But Kelly is special in a different way. You might say extra special. And if I had not been 11 years old at the time, I would have been thinking words along the lines of, oh, for fuck's sake. And how did you know she was special? Asked my mother. How could you tell? Why was she doing this? Making my classmates itemize all the ways that Kelly was different. Did my mother not know that children were shits? Did she have no idea all those Kelly qualities she was forcing them to scrutinize would be thrown viciously distorted into my face at recess? 
The kids respectfully answered my mother. They cited the rocking, the humming, the whispering to herself. One kid attempted to reference the fact that Kelly was fat by calling it her kind of squishiness, which made my mother laugh. To me, it felt like they were stockpiling ammo. Why did God make Kelly the way she is, do you think? My mother asked, silencing everyone. I looked up, interested at last. It was not a question my mother had ever brought up before. My mother was an ours is not to question why kind of gal, or so I'd always thought. The idea that she might actually have been formulating an answer to such an unfathomable question over the years without my knowledge was tantalizing. One brave child, the class keener, tried to answer, maybe for us to help. I knew my mother and I knew this was the wrong answer. On some level, I was surprised she didn't take umbrage and overturn the table because imagine if I had said such a thing, that Kelly was put on earth for others as a kind of pet, a creature of need and dependence offered up by the almighty, the way a parent gives a child a hamster in order to impart responsibility. No. My mother had always maintained that Kelly was her own person of and for herself, just like anyone else. She always stopped short of saying independent because that of course was clearly not the case. Kelly could never be independent. Yet I knew weirdly that was what she meant. In her mind, somehow Kelly stood on her own. But instead of overturning the table, my mother told the keener in her gentle lilting voice, I think that's lovely. But are we all here to help one another? The kids nodded in drugged cultish unison. So just as we help Kelly, doesn't Kelly help us? The kids nodded some more, marionette heads at the ends of bobbing strings. And how does Kelly help us? prompted my mother. A few jaws went slack. They didn't know, but they were waiting to hear. And so was I. By teaching us, said my mother, to be selfless selfless, a few of the kids repeated. They were struggling with the unfamiliar word. It was not a word your average 11 year old would have had much use for up to this point. To give of ourselves, said my mother, to be kind. Now the nodding started up again. Kind, they understood. I even heard a few quiet exclaimed ahs around the room. At the end of the class, to Kelly's delight, my mother encouraged everyone to go up to my sister and shake her hand. And how about this? There was no exaggerated rocking and gibbering directed at me over recess. No mockery, no drooling idiot faces pushed into mine. My mother's magic had made my classmates briefly kind. Oh, that's powerful. That's powerful. And you know, we recognize this from our own childhoods, right? This moment, there's almost like a switch, right, in childhood where kids can be cruel or kind. Um, and so often that switch goes down to cruel, right, instead of upward to kind, it needs like an Irene to do kind. What do you think it is? Like, what do you think, how can we manipulate that switch in people, right? <laughs> do we need to walk around with Kellys and like have this little spiel ready? But what, what do you think? I, what what happened there in that scene? <laughs> I think it's genuinely Irene. I mean, I think she's she has a way. She has she really believes what she's saying, and she has a benevolence. And she she's you know the 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 scene is sort of described in like almost hypnotic turns. Like the kids are like just going yes, Miss Irene. Kind of right, thing. right. Cultish, <laughs> and I, I think. Yeah. And she's got the gentle lilting voice, and I think she just kind of inspires them to be their better selves when it comes to someone like Kelly. And also she's sort of, I mean, this is what Irene has always wanted to do with respect to Karen. She wants to impart that, you know, what she does as the caregiver of Kelly is, is a beautiful, wonderful thing. And it's selfless and it's, it's holy and it's, you know, something that could make the whole world a better place kind of thing. And, um, and you know, there's something really wonderful and, and seductive about that. But at the same time, there's something seductive about that that Karen is super threatened by. Like she she she's tempted by that seduction, but she knows she knows where it leads, and she's not sure. As a young person, she's not sure that she wants to go down that path. 
Do you think that the work of a caregiver, it's not solely directed towards Kelly, right? The work of a caregiver, mm -hmm. what Irene is doing in the world is also like outward work, right? Yeah. Do you think caregivers also bear this responsibility to like go forth and tell people about um, developmental disabilities or not maybe as a responsibility, but is this something that they have to do anyway as part of the job? This is one of those unfortunate like... So yeah, Some people dude. choose to, and I mean, it's understandable because you do have that feeling like, you know, if people just got to know Kelly kind of thing, you know what I mean? If people just got to know this community, they would understand and maybe they would want to participate, et cetera, et cetera. But I have so, I mean, I have so many conflicting feelings about that role that Irene has taken on. I mean, part of it is that Irene is, is Kelly's mother. So, you know, you start out in that caregiving role. Right. And then, like, it, it's not something you're necessarily willing to relinquish. And if there's no need to relinquish it, like, if you know, Kelly's not going to get to that point where she's 18 and she's heading to college, mm -hmm. you know, what's Irene to do, basically? But, you know, caregivers take on so much. And a lot of them, like, I think of my parents and my they looked after my grandparents until they, you know, they died, basically. And, and my grandfather had a stroke, so he required, you know, pretty serious care. And then my grandmother lived to be 100. So in her final decade, she required pretty serious care as a senior citizen. And then in my grandfather's will, he, you know, required my dad, basically, in the will to take care of his brother, my uncle, for the rest of his life. So I feel like, you know, my parents were a young, vigorous couple. They were, my dad was an entrepreneur. He started start starting his own businesses. They both worked really, really hard. And I think when they sort of took my grandparents in, they never really realized how hard it was gonna get. And it got to a point where um, they really needed help. And there was a lot of, there was a lot of kind of um, frustration in our extended family. Like, like they were sort of asking aunts and uncles for help. and. And, um, you know, the aunts and uncles were saying, well, nobody asked you to take this on. And it's like, but we, <laughs> we don't get to go on vacations. We don't get to go anywhere or do anything. <laughs> so it became, it became a lot. And my dad always felt like, you know, and then he had to take, take over for my uncle. And I, I feel like my dad always felt like, you know, it would have been nice if we could have gotten a break at some point. Um, now, on the other side of that, there's some caregivers who are like, yeah, they're evangelists for, for what they're doing. And, and there's a caregiving community. And I, sometimes I wish, you know, um, my parents had, had had that sort of thing to take advantage of, where you talk to other people like yourself and you, you know, you go to, you know, community events like, you know, Kelly's Friendship Center is talked about and um, the uh, Gorsebrook place, the community that Karen discovers ends up being like a really wonderful place. Um, and I think, you know, I think it's just the difference between the, the Irenes and the Karens of the world where the Irenes are just like all in because that's what they've chosen and they sort of bring an energy to it. Um, and then there's the people who kind of have it thrust upon them and they don't know if they're gonna, they wanna be all in, but you kind of have no choice. Yeah, well, let's, let's talk about the help, right? When you do reach out for help, <laughs> What mm -hmm. happens when a fellow like Trevor comes into the picture here? Uh, like he is the villain that everybody loves to like hate, right? He's a recognizable kind of person in our lives. And I felt I found myself wanting to diagnose him like from mm -hmm. the beginning. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there's this, on one hand, he's like, like pathological, right? And like clinically so. Yeah. And then on the other hand, you realize that men like this are walking around the world in smaller doses, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. he can be, uh, he's just entitled and like grandiose and that's not quite pathological that's just kind of like a, a jerk right mm -hmm. um, so, yeah right right that's another one um so i felt to like some degree this was almost a story of what happens when like entitlement goes amok right like it doesn't yeah. have to be pathological but this is what it, people are capable of doing regular people mm -hmm. when you're a little bit vulnerable and uh, they've been brought up to talk to people anyhow and to treat people anyhow. Did you have like a, 
in mind, was he pathological or was he just a regular guy? Where on the spectrum uh, was he for you? It's it's so funny that you say you found yourself wanting to diagnose him. because I, I did a, a book club a couple of weeks ago where I, I was like in an argument with a reader who said, no, he's a sociopath. He, he's a, <laughs> <laughs> I diagnosed him clinically as a psychopath. He's got this and this and this. And I was like, well, I think maybe he's closer to a malignant narcissist. And he was like, no. Um, <laughs> So I don't know. I mean, and the reason I was sort of resistant to the idea of Trevor as a sociopath, as I, I you know, I think of them as people without empathy mm, mm. and people who don't feel things deeply. And I feel like Trevor is like a bottomless pit of emotional needs. Um, and that's kind of, that's what's behind everything that he does. He's, he's you know, he just wants to be loved, basically, um, which sounds like a very benign thing. Like, how wonderful he wants to be loved. <laughs> but he's, he's never been, you know, for, for whatever reason, whatever happened in his childhood, it's just never been, he's never been able to get enough out of anybody. Um, and so he feels like if he can just insert himself into this family and make himself useful to them, and his version of making himself useful is taking over the sanctuary. Right. And yeah, there's this great line. Uh, it's on page 296. I think it's Jessica who says it. Um, love is what, uh, oh, I need to find it exactly. Love is the excuse these people use, right? Speaking about Trevor, mm -hmm. love is what they use. Um, now, it's one thing if, you know, some guy like Trevor comes up to you, you don't know him and he punches you in the face, but there's another thing, like if this is a part of your caregiving team mm -hmm. and there's both this abuse kind of wrapped up with love at the same time. Um, yeah, I guess I'm sort of wondering about like this, how does love complicate abuse here, right? You know, like he, you say he's this bottomless pit who needs love. Mm -hmm. And he's able to extend love to some degree. And I think that makes us able to sort of like forgive him a little bit sometimes. I, I'm curious to hear what other readers thought. Maybe they hated him from the beginning, felt no sympathy whatsoever. Um, but do you think that's what complicates him? Just this troubled relationship to love? I mean, he's a complicated guy. Yeah, <laughs> but, definitely. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, he, he's a man who you know, who is traditionally masculine, um, brought up, you know, with all that kind of male toxicity that he's, that's been inured into him where he's not supposed to, he's not supposed to be empathetic. He's not supposed to um, be vulnerable. And so as a result, he's not particularly empathetic, but he does have these needs, but he, he, he can't, he doesn't know how to ask to have them met other than to demand that they be met mm. and when they're not met he becomes enraged and that's that's what makes him dangerous it's just like every time he's wounded every time his feelings are hurt every time he feels like you know people just aren't doing what he wants them to do he becomes enraged and sort of more and more dangerous with every outburst and he says he's doing this out of love right like he 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 says, like, it's because I care and I'm trying to help you. And like, why won't you take the help and all of those things? Yeah. Um, which made me think, like, do I not recognize what love is in this case? Do I not? Uh, you know, like, it, it really falls back on a reasonable person to sort of question whether it's my perception that's off or whether this guy is off. It's, well, yeah. I, think, I think it's because his, his idea of love is, is all inward directed, like, hmm. Why, why aren't I getting my needs yet? I'm doing everything for you. I'm going right. out of my way to do right. this and this. And you guys then go change the locks or whatever. Right. So, so it's just like, I'm doing my part. What's right. going on with you? So how do you think we fix a guy like, like Trevor, like, or fix a situation like Trevor? I think he's more than a guy. He's a situation. Um, because on, do you go like the legal route? Do you get him fired from his job? Does he have to hit some kind of rock bottom? Or is the solution more in, especially in the aftermath of like Trevor, right? Is the solution not in like pursuing some kind of legal course, but in like something psychologically that happens within the victim? Like what's what's the solution for, for a guy like Trevor? Oh, How do you fix a problem like Trevor? Oh, I don't know. I mean, that's, <laughs> the, that's the 
big massive question mark at the end of the novel I think because Karen you know Karen has this realization like oh man this is going to drag on like she just realizes he's obsessed and there's no getting him out of our lives really and she sort of describes she sort of projects into the future and says this happened this happened restraining orders etc like it just became a thing um, but the the only good part of it was she was finally like awake like she finally figured out what Trevor was doing and who he was mm -hmm. um, but then she says it doesn't stop until he finds somebody else to put right. that up. so you know unless there is psychiatric <laughs> intervention at some point uh, I think I feel like Trevor's he's got his pattern and this is he's going to be doing this kind of stuff over and over and over again just trying to find somebody who's right. going to you know who's going to fix him Oh. It's that's a real terrifying thing I think about this novel, right? Especially the ending. It's like it's at the end of a horror movie, most likely you like kill the monster, but yeah. your monster just keeps living and just he's out there loose. Um, yeah. yeah, he can step into any of our lives at any point, right? This guy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's so curious. There are two gestures in the novel, right? That really sort of trip me up, and one of them is like the end of the novel where Trevor's like reaching his hand out mm -hmm. uh, to, to Karen. And then there's another moment, um, I think they're in the kitchen and he does, um, you describe the gesture as sort of like reaching out his hands as if he's got like a stick matter or something mm -hmm. and it causes her to back away. Right. And why, I mean, that gesture feels like the right note to me, right? This guy like uh -huh. reaching out towards Karen, the reader, that I voice. Um, and just approaching and I felt my neck like scrunching into my neck at the end of this novel. Right? Is that the note you meant here? Like this note of like he's coming for you? Yeah, I, yeah, kind of. I mean, that's definitely Karen's sort of visceral reactions like, oh God. But um, I, I think that the, I mean, I, I write really intuitively at times and that, and I, you know, and I'm not necessarily thinking about what's actually going on is just kind of happening as I'm writing but I looking back I feel like there's something about open open handedness that I, I find really vulnerable mm -hmm. and I feel like this was this this is sort of Trevor's first you know love me kind of gesture if you know what I mean and of course like Ugh, it doesn't look particularly affectionate at all because that's, <laughs> that's the contradiction of Trevor he's like he's like Frankenstein going oh <laughs> terrifying right. but right. but really it's it's him and that's the same thing with the gesture at the end it's him just like reaching out just trying to connect. yeah I really appreciate that you don't interpret it for us right it's just this gesture coming at us and it's like what do we make so it's just like what do we make of all of the signals he's been and all of the actions he's been doing throughout the novel and you yeah. just leave it that's like the perfect open ending right like that is nailing an open ending not just with like weird ambiguity and stuff like that but that gesture that the reader has to sort of live with, right? Um, really, really, really brilliant. Um, we'll move on to questions in about seven minutes sure. here. So uh, another reminder to uh, populate the Q&A with your questions and we'll come to them soon. Um, who should we talk about next? There's Karen, there's Jessica, there's Irene. <laughs> let's see. All right, let's talk about Karen, okay? Karen. Sure. I felt some frustration with her. I think many people did because of course we're hovering in our safe and sanitized space outside of the novel and we're thinking, Karen, you should know better. Look, Jessica's talking to you. Look, I know better, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> she's not a foolish woman, Lynn, right? Like yeah. she's, yeah, she's a lawyer. She's been around. She's had really intense emotional experiences. She's been a caregiver. Um, yet she is duped or drawn in yeah. By Trevor, yeah. um, you, you obviously deliberately wrote her this way, right? You didn't want to write somebody who was like completely like idiotic or no. somebody who could completely like sort through everything. Yeah. Do you think like that was the middle ground? Like she was a normal person in terms of gullibility and trust? Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like we're meeting Karen at a point where mm. she's almost in a kind of fugue. Like mm. of, of grief and sort of um, overwhelm. Uh, so, you know, she's dealing with her mother, like with the immediate aftermath of her mother's death. She's in like this kind of swirl of guilt. And she's in a process of second guessing herself that 
you know, that is very, that is very middle aged. It's very midlife crisis kind of like, oh, what if all my choices were wrong? Basically, all my life choices. So everything right. I kind of based my life on, that was wrong. And that's that's part of what's involved in, you know, going back over all her arguments with Irene and their sort of fundamental disagreement and thinking, yeah, maybe she's maybe I was selfish. Maybe I was like right. just all about myself. Maybe I did do like womanhood wrong, essentially. And then Trevor comes in and like is is basically like, yeah. <laughs> like you, re you reaffirm every self-doubt she's having intuitively He's like yeah you're doing womanhood wrong you're a weird kind of woman who doesn't even have a family you weren't here for your mother or your sister you're like god that's right. like terrible but thankfully the guilt no, too yeah yeah the guilt and so you can make up for it so he just comes in at a time when she's like more emotionally vulnerable than she's probably ever been in her life and it's true i mean part of the reason i made her a lawyer is that I just wanted to sort of cue the audience that this, this is a very intelligent and competent person at the best of times. Um, and I, I realize she's kind of annoying right now <laughs> because she's just constantly second guessing herself and blaming herself and berating herself um, and thinking obsessively about things. But it's just because it's just because of this particular state she's in that Trevor is able to take advantage of. <laughs> Yeah, right. And there are moments when she stands up for herself and I'm like cheering her along. I'm like, more of that, more of that, that standoff towards the end of the book, right? That long, yeah. I, I, yeah, it was just really, really intense and like physical for me that how is she going to get out of this, right? Yeah. That's like one of those uh, like Breaking Bad scenes, like how, just how are they going to get out of this mess right now? Um, And then we've got as a kind of counterpoint, Jessica here, mm -hmm. who's had a really terrible upbringing like an unimaginably terrible upbringing and yet is able to um, like put her life together mm -hmm. and do what I think is like remarkable acts of forgiveness in the novel right mm -hmm. to get to this place where she's able to uh, even forgive uh, for that slap across the face and yet maintain her her poise I, yeah I am a bit stunned by her survival I think in the mm -hmm. novel, right? Mm -hmm. um, after after so many obstacles, what what did Jessica? What 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 was her purpose in the novel there for you? Not just as a foil to sort of discuss things with um, with Karen, but what was she doing emotionally in the novel for you? Um, a few things. I mean, she was she like on a really sort of basic structural level. I needed to get. Karen out of her head every once in a while yeah. and I needed to kind of be able to open the the window of this this sort of cloistered world that she's in just with Kelly and Trevor um and so it was kind of like Jessica sort of serves as a counterbalance she serves as you know just like a breath of fresh air and Karen has to kind of like intuit that about her as well like she sort of she sort of grasps at Jessica, kind of realizing, like, this is a normal person. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> she's relatively right. healthy, and she's just of the world. And, like, Karen is very much not of the world right now. She's, she's in her own kind of haunted house, basically, mm. with Kelly and Trevor. Um, so it, it just got us out of the house. It got Karen out of the house. It got Karen out of her head. But also, you know, Jessica is kind of this counterbalance of mental health, too, because she, she does have this, like, hideous abuse in her past that um, Karen is sort of notionally aware of, but she knows it happened and she doesn't know how to be about it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's kind of like if Karen didn't know that about Jessica, she would probably dismiss her as kind of a lightweight because she's, you know, she's sort of, she's sort of blonde and perky. She looks like a news anchor and she's, she's a real estate agent with which Karen doesn't necessarily think of as serious career because she's kind of a snob. Um, but she, she knows that like Jessica has gone through this heavy, heavy shit and she seems great. She seems fine. Um, but, the, but what's important about that background for Jessica is that she's got she's got radar 
like when the red yep. flags are fluttering, she sees every one of them yep. from the very beginning. Um, she just, you know, she just intuits toxicity. She, her, she's got this finely attuned radar for toxicity and she sees it in Trevor. So she's just, she's just kind of, you know, this siren of, um, of well-being and mental health that's calling out to Karen. And, you know, Karen has to get to her eventually. It's, it's sort of a long journey, but eventually Karen gets to the point where it's like, oh yeah, Jessica is the friend I'm supposed to be turning to right now, not Trevor. Right, right, not Trevor, right, to have the option, right? I feel, wonder what was happening towards the end of Irene's life as she was becoming more and more isolated, right? Mm -hmm. um, and fewer people to turn out to. That creepy picture, the selfie with Trevor's arm around her and the mom saying, oh, or no, you know, yeah. another frozen moment. Oh. All right, let's turn to some questions and let's see what we have here. Cool. Um, so we've got a question here from uh leslie harris i'm curious what your reading inspirations i'm curious what were your reading inspirations as a child and today hmm. well um just with uh, kind of in terms of what's influenced this book in hmm. particular uh i read a lot of stephen king when i was a kid hmm. and i always wanted to write novels like Stephen King. And then I ended up writing these literary novels. I don't know what happened, um, but I always had it in the back of my mind. I would, I would write something scary one of these days. And um, I feel like I finally kind of got there with, with this novel, uh, much, much to my pleasure. So I, I sort of, I tip my hat to Stephen King for that. Um, I mean, what, otherwise when I was younger, I was just, you know, I was reading everything. Um, but I remember like, I remember being particularly influenced when, you know, I was in my early twenties um, when I realized that there were writers from the Maritimes who were, who were doing okay and who were writing um, about maritime communities, such as the one that I grew up in. So that was, there was writers like David Adams Richards and Alden Nolan. And then I remember sort of having the same uh, experience of revelation when I realized there were women writers. <laughs> Um, like, like incredibly great women writers, like, um, and Canadian women writers like Margaret Atwood, uh, and Alice Munro, and Alice Munro, like, sort of my whole life continues to be a huge inspiration in, in sort of different ways as I get older. Like, I just sort of, I feel like more layers of Alice Munro are, are revealed to me as I get older, which is, which is a really cool experience. Right. Um, I'm really liking Lydia Davis short stories oh, right now. Good, yeah. good pandemic reading because they're so short and pithy and weird. Right. So that, that's a lot of fun. And super clean sentences, right? It's something about her is just like Crazy. pure stylus, like just oof. Yeah. 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 Love her. She, she's a word choice obsessive. I remember I, I tweeted, I tweeted one of her stories because you can tweet her stories. They're so mm. short. And then somebody like tweeted back at me. Oh, that's such a terrible sentence. And I almost lost my mind. <laughs> I was like, it's Lydia David. It's not, if it's terrible, she wants it to be terrible. Right. Right. Here's another one for you. Uh, this is from Kathy White. I am intrigued by Trevor. How do you think your mother would have presented a Trevor to your religion class? Or I guess it's Irene. What is his God given purpose? Oh, Jesus. What is his God given purpose? <laughs> I mean, so Irene is a Catholic, right? That's kind of like at the core of her morality and like a, a, a woman Catholic who was, you know, my mother's generation raised with all those kind of super patriarchal values about what women are supposed to do. Um, and women are supposed to suck it up ultimately is that's the, that's the Coles Notes version of, of Irene's um, morality, I think. Um, and that, that's how Karen would put it, obviously. That's not how Irene would put it. Uh, so I think, you know, without, before she gets to know him too deeply, I think Irene would sort of look at, at Trevor the way Trevor looks at Trevor, which is like someone who just needs to be loved, someone who needs to be taken care of, someone who needs to be understood. You have to kind of, if there's a, a troublesome male in the room who's like, you know, a bull in a china shop and causing, causing all sorts of fuss, 
you have to coddle them and you have to find out what they need and you have to try to give them what they need. Um, and I'm sure, you know, that was Irene's instinct with Trevor. And to an extent that was Karen's instinct with Trevor too. Like she, there's moments when she finds herself kind of accommodating him, accommodating his, his feelings and accommodating his, you know, his uh, bad moods and just like knowing what she needs to say in order to calm him down. Um, and I think she, you know, she learned that well, she has those instincts because all women have those instincts. But Irene, Irene was really, really had them, um, you know, she, she, they were bred in the bone for her. And so I think, you know, that would be her, her instinct with someone like Trevor. And it would only be later on when she really got to know the trouble that Trevor is that she would, you know, have formed a different opinion. Yeah, that moment where she just tosses the like used dish rag in the in the bottom cabinet, right? Like that's the metaphor for like just done with it. Just done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why am I trying to please everybody? Right. All right. Thanks, Kathy, for that question. This one is from Sherry Parkin. You put me through a plethora of emotions reading this book. Your ability to build tension caused me stress. I not only disliked Trevor, but felt I wanted to smack sense into Karen. Did you feel the tension while writing this book? Yes, I, I mean, I did, but also I was cultivating it because I did want this to be a, a stressful, suspenseful experience for readers. And it was, it was new for me to write that way. Um, so, and I, I mean, I, I, I learned a lot of tricks from writing TV because TV is all sort of about suspense. Like you, you have to make the audience want to know what happens next. Um, and after writing TV for a few years, I found, I think that's another reason why I was finally able to write my scary novel. Like I, I realized I, I, I knew those tricks now and I know how to, how to basically scare the crap out of, out of readers. Um, so I felt the tension, but I was also, you know, I, I wanted that tension. I wanted, I wanted it to be as scary as possible. What I really, I mean, what I was going through emotionally with the book was really much more involved with Karen and Irene's relationship and Karen's, Karen's guilt about her mother and just like what she's, you know, just grappling with mortality, like her, her the, the mortality of her mother, their, all their unfinished emotional business and, um, you know, and just looking back on who she is and who she's been and if she's been, if she's done the right thing all these years. Mm -hmm. This question follows up nicely on that is from Natalie McDonough. The mom character in this book and your other work seems to me to be a nice tribute to Phyllis. Oh, that's my mom. <laughs> okay, that's, is that your answer? <laughs> it's an observation. Is this is some of your, your life coming out here? Or? So could you re read the question again? It's just the, the mom care, not really a question, actually. Yeah, the mom yeah. character in this book and your other work seems to me to be a nice tribute to Phyllis. Yeah, is it a tribute? Um, I don't think it's a tribute, but I mean, I did want to write, I did want to write a mother and daughter story um, because just, just because, you know, I, I have a great relationship with my mom. We're nothing like Karen and, and Irene, um, but my mom was, very Catholic and uh, she had like similar um, a similar point of view to Irene and the the scene where they're they're in the Woolworths or whatever the store is and Irene's throwing cushions yeah. <laughs> at, um, at uh, Karen and they have platitudes written on them and they're sort of arguing about you know is it is it the journey or is it the destination basically like what's the more most important thing I, I never had the cushion throwing thing happen with my mother but we did we did often have that argument like is, is is life about the destination or is it about the journey and my mother was very much in the destination camp <laughs> see it okay we've got uh hazel kellner titles are very difficult to create this is a fascinating title for a fascinating albeit chilling story Please give us some glimpses into what went into creating what is surely a multi-layered title. Yeah, also very creepy title, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it's a bit of a story. I, I wanted to call the book The Giver and that was the title from the very beginning and that was what I was thinking of it, of it as throughout the entire 
well, maybe like I probably came up with the title when I was about halfway through and there I was like, good, I have my title. I liked how sort of simple and inelegant it was like the word giver isn't really a word, but I, I, I kind of liked it. It sounded like something Trevor would call himself. So it's like, great. Um, but then when it got time to submit manuscripts, somebody told me there was a, a kid's novel called The Giver. And I was like, oh, big deal. It's a kid's novel. Nobody would have read it. But it turned out it was like, like a million bestseller. So I couldn't call my book The Giver after that. Um, so then it's, it's like, oh, I have my title and it's been snatched away from me. And now it does, I don't know what to, what to call it. So I was in that position that I hate being in where you're just like sitting around trying to think of a title, which I was in that, the same position for the antagonist, um, a title I ended up really liking. What was oh, it before? Pardon? What was it before, your it, working title? Oh, I wanted to call it God Awful, but like the publisher, there's no way the publisher is going to let me call my novel. The hell going to God Awful. <laughs> yeah, it's like paint a big target on the novel basically for critics. Um, so I didn't call it that. But anyway, so uh, watching you without me. So that's the name of a Kate Bush song from Hounds of Love. Oh. And Hounds of Love was you know, one of the first, it's like the first album I ever bought, I think. Um, and I had been thinking about that song on and off as I was, it was writing the book because it's like, if you listen to it, like go on to Spotify and check it out. It's actually a lot like the book. Like there's, there's just, there's, it has this quality that's very spooky. And one of the lines is, there's a ghost in our house just watching you without me. Um, so it's a sense of like absence, but also like a, a mysterious presence in the way that, you know, Irene is an absence in the book, but Trevor is sort of a presence that um, that is there when they don't know he's there. I don't know. So it all kind of, I was thinking of this, this song and then I was like, oh, but I could use that title maybe. Um, and I tried it out on a few people, my editor and my husband, and, and they liked it. So yeah. I went for it. Yeah, it makes you want to know more, right? Like who's watching who or without who, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really, yeah. It's like this That's circular it. thing. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, this one is from Adrian, Adrian Seven. Hi, Adrian. Trauma is often central to your work. How do you prepare yourself as a writer and reader for that? Oh, um, hmm. I don't know. I mean... It sounds kind of callous, but, but I guess I try to intellectualize it. Um, like, it's like, I don't go into the trauma uh, because I don't want to. <laughs> um, I just find that, I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily want to go through the fires of hell um, to, to render a believable, you know, um, result, but I, I want a believable result. Um, so I just, I don't, I don't know, I just, what I try to do is focus on the aftermath, focus on what feels to me like real emotions, the, the kind of things that real people do when they're, when they're affected by trauma. Um, and you know what, in, in a lot of cases, what people do is like hurt themselves in mm -hmm. some way. Um, so that was like a big thing in the antagonist, this, this guy who just kind of couldn't stop getting in his own way because he was running away from this terrible trauma in his past. Um, so yeah, so I just think more about what I see in the real world with respect to how people how people tend to grapple with trauma and try to try to bring that onto the page. Mm. I think we've got time for a couple more questions here. We've got a long one here about plays from Janice McKay. Um, I love how the house and the neighborhood were characters in the book. The laundry room with its framed pictures made me sad. It's as though Irene tried to build a safe haven in what must have felt like a prison to her. I feel like I really connected to this book because I'm almost certain uh, that I live in or near the neighborhood in which it is set. Is it a mixture of the Manor Park, Woodlawn, and Nantucket neighborhoods in Dartmouth? Super close. Um, <laughs> I mean, the 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 suburb that I was thinking of was was Portland Estates. Mm. Um, but I really, I'm, I really appreciate you saying that just because, I mean, I, I, I do not like those suburbs. They're, I find them very kind of like soulless and they're, you know, 
like the way Karen describes them, it's like the car dealerships and the superstore and the Starbucks and like the four lane highway and stuff. It's just like, it's not a comfortable place to be. It's not like a cozy neighborhood. And I made this sort of decision when I was writing the book, because when people write about the Maritimes, there's all these cliches that sort of immediately come rushing to the front of your mind when you think Atlantic Canada and you think you think this sort of cozy sort of rural or small town familial kind of place with you know laundry hanging on the clothesline and the fiddles playing and stuff like that and I was just I am writing the opposite of that I'm just writing a story that takes place in Atlantic Canada that's in this sort of blank soulless suburb but I'm, I just I'm going to show that it does it does have a soul it's just sort of it's just sort of buried under the the Tim Hortons and the cul-de-sacs and, and everything else so I'm oh, the I'm Swiss chalets for dinner you know it's just Swiss <laughs> LA. I like yeah. a good Swiss chalet yeah so it feels like <laughs> a risk to kind of decide you're going to showcase that kind of that kind of um colorless sort of neighborhood but I'm I'm glad that it was appreciated mm. so thank you you know, one of my favorite passages uh, here, it's on 211, and it's your description of like Toronto or how uh, like Atlantic Canada, Canadians will see like uh, people from Toronto. Uh, we've got time. Lynn, would you mind reading just like it's 211 if you've got your book close by? Is that paragraph uh, was a stock character in Trevor's mind? Okay. For example, the daughter lived in Toronto. Oh, yeah. Check. Just this paragraph? Yeah. Sure. So at, at first, Irene's daughter Karen was something of a stock character in Trevor's mind. Not a villain exactly, but definitely a variety of jerk. Reedy would mention her from time to time, and Trevor unconsciously built himself a picture based on his own assumption, intermingled with the vague details Irene sometimes passed along. For example, the daughter lived in Toronto, so that was pretty much a strike against her right there. <laughs> Toronto, as every East Coast Canadian is raised to understand, is where the nation's our souls congregate. It is a place for people who care only about work, but not even real work, not construction or the fisheries, but some vague, glad handy business that takes place in office towers and requires the wearing of suits and a lot of insincere smiling and shaking of hands. Such people live in towers identical to the towers in which they work. They spend what little free time they have shuttling themselves from one tower to the next, existing at the gloomy heart of a cluster of such towers where the rays of the sun can never reach them. They don't have fields or backyards because fields and backyards are places for picnics and barbecues, friends and families. And these people may have friends, insincerely grinning, glad handy friends exactly like themselves, but they don't have families. And they don't have families, one supposes, because they don't have souls. That's brilliant, eh? <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's a bit of a stinger there, but okay. <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, we've got about maybe just one more minute here. Um, oh, wow. There's a question. Yeah, it just flew by. It flew by. Yeah. Uh, there's a question here about uh, from Lorraine Johansson. I heard that Ian Williams has a new book coming out in the, new, in the near future. Can you both talk about what may be coming next in your writing? I've got a book coming out this fall. It's a collection of essays about how we relate to each other racially. Uh, looking forward to that. Lynn, what are you working on? I'm not really working on anything. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not working on fiction right now. I'm thinking about something, um, maybe something even more pot boilery than the last one, um, because I'm, I've had a lot of fun writing that suspense. So I, I might even sort of jack it up with the next book. Like towards horror or towards like, like slashers or you know, Ripper. Uh, more, oh. more on the horror side of things, I think. Oh, I feel like you've been doing this your whole career, right? To some degree, it's just been underground, right? This kind of yeah. real horrific violence. Yeah. And now to see it like coming up through the through the soil. Yeah. Oof. Looking forward <laughs> to it. All right. Thank you, Lynn. I'm going to turn things back over to Daphna. Um, or Alana. There we go. There's Daphna. <laughs> Hi there. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much, Ian. Thank you so much. Lynn, um, thank you all for joining us this evening. I hope you enjoyed hearing from our author and our interviewer. If you know anybody who has missed this particular interview and book club, um, it can be found later during the week on our YouTube channel or on our website. And please join us on July 5th 
to hear author Marilyn Simmons interview Emily St. John Mandel, author of The Glass Hotel. If you subscribe to our um, book club mailing list, you will be sent a registration notification. If not, please visit our website for more information. And thank you again for joining us. Have a great evening.